Hello, everybody. Welcome to our panel today. I'm so happy to be with you as your moderator. Uh, welcome. My name is Steph. My pronouns are she and her, and I am from Air Miles. I work on our sustainability and inclusion team, and I'm so excited to be here. I'm also a very proud member and founder of PAL, which is our employee resource group. Now, I shouldn't say employee resource group. I actually mean business employee resource, because that's what we're here to talk about today. This is a panel that's dedicated to the journey from ERG, Employee Resource Group, to Business Employee Resource Group. Um, we're gonna have a conversation about how we start to shift the purpose of our Employee Resource Group um, to be more aligned and connected to our organization's business output and value. I'm joined by three incredible panelists today who will reveal themselves in a moment, um, who are gonna flesh out this idea with me. Um, we're going to share our own perspectives and real life experiences of how this has come to life in our own employee resource group. I'm joined by Galen Love, who's the National Education Product Marketing Lead for Microsoft. I'm joined by Mark Lawton, who's the Senior Manager for Franchise Growth Retail for Coca-Cola Limited. And Andrew Mainprize, who's the Director of Marketing Transformation at Rogers Communication. While we all hold very different roles in our respective organizations, we all have a very similar passion for the growth and success of our employee resource group. For anybody listening, whether it's part of a group, whether you're part of a group, hoping to start one, or just curious of how this group shows value and is part of the organization, these folks have so much experience and they're very willing to share. Um, so feel free to use the chat function on your Zoom window to ask any questions. Um, we'll make sure to pop them through and take time at the end, to answer questions and talk through with you if you have any questions on starting an employee resource group or the content that we're sharing. Uh, so we'll get started with a bit of a deeper introduction to our panelists. I'll let them tell you the good stuff. Uh, friends, I'm hoping we can start by sharing a little bit about yourself and a brief introduction to the BERG that you support. Andrew, let's start with you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Steph, and great to meet everybody. Glad to be here today. Uh, Andrew Main Prize, Rogers Communications. Uh, my role on the BERG is actually I was one of the founding members uh, for Rogers back in 2013. So our ERG is named Spectrum, Spectrum Employee Resource Group for the LGBTQ2S plus community. Uh, we were founded very much on a grassroots basis uh, by a group of employees that had a like-minded goal to get together, start networking, and figure out how far it could go. Um, since our inception in 2013, we've definitely made strides. We've made incredible partnerships with the business. And we're now at a place where we're definitely tied and integrated into the IND strategy for Rogers as a whole. So I'm excited to share the learnings and also excited to learn from some of my co-panelists today. Thanks, Steph. Awesome. Okay, so let's turn it over to Mark. Thanks, Steph. Um, so nice to meet everybody. Um, so my name is Mark and I um, began my BRG journey back in the UK where I'm originally from, where I was an active member of the Walmart UK and um, business resource group. Um, and then when I actually moved to Canada, um, I joined Coca-Cola um, and they didn't currently have um, an LGBTQ plus group. So it was something once I became established in my role that I actually um, founded that, um, that group for the, for the Canadian business. Um, and we've just been going from strength to strength ever since. So. Awesome. Yeah. Cool, thank you for sharing. All right, Galen, take us home. There's that video button. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. My name is Galen. I use pronouns he and him. Uh, and I have the pleasure of joining you all today from Toronto, where it is steamy hot outside, um, especially when you have long hair like I do. I actually haven't had a haircut since January 2020, so I'm letting this COVID hair grow out, so I sometimes tie it back in the band. Uh, I'm, uh, I got my long hair, I got gray glasses on, and kind of a purplish shirt on a support each other rainbow background, uh, for those who can't see it. Um, and so at Microsoft, I actually started the Gleam chapter which was initially an acronym, which was Gay and Lesbian Employees at Microsoft, um, which is, which is uh, the ERG's name back in when it was started in the early 90s, late 80s. Uh, we've actually rebranded it. It's still Gleam, but it's Global 
LGBTQ plus employees and allies at Microsoft. Um, something I'd love to share with you all that not many people realize, but um, Microsoft was actually the first Fortune 500 company uh, to provide same-sex domestic partnerships back in 1993. And so since then, Gleam, as an organization to advocate for employees internally, has definitely transformed uh, and is now looking at how we are actually advocating for change to be more inclusive of the LGBTQ plus community around the world uh, in both our internal operations, our supply chain channels, uh, how we engage with our partners, and also what products and services we deliver to customers. Awesome. Thank you so much, Galen. And why don't you actually just stay on the line here? Because I'd actually love you to kick us off as we get started. So everybody, we're here to talk about kind of the changing role of employee resource groups. Employee resource groups are traditionally a space where internal associates can share, can seek out community, can have like-minded folks to share their experiences with. They also play a key role in advocating to the organization on behalf of their group. Um, some of the things that you that I've seen my employee resource group do things like internal training, community chats, where we're bringing people together to have that tough conversation. And we've seen so much success in this. And, and really, you're starting to see employee resource group as a key partner as we try to go externally and support our business in strategically reaching out to these communities. Um, so what we're going to do is talk a little bit about how we start to make that shift. How do you start to carve out space? for your employee resource group to contribute strategically to the organization. Galen, I'm wondering if you could kick us off with some of your experiences on how you started to make that transition. Yeah, I, a couple of things here come to mind for me. Um, I think number one is for an organization to recognize uh, that your employee resource groups from whatever diverse groups they're representing, this is something that they're doing because they care. Um, it's kind of like volunteer work. And so should you really be volunteering for your employer, your employee by not, not really. So how can how can an organization recognize that work, reward that work? It's got something that's baked in. You're gonna get a lot more engagement, more action, more commitment uh, when a company is recognizing that, you know, there's your day job and your gay job. And so what we're trying to do here is to connect the dots between your day job and gay job. How can they be ultimately connected together and have shared success. So that's the first thing. The second thing I think you, in, that goes with this is how do you make every single employee share that commitment? Uh, so it's not just the volunteers putting their hand up saying, I care, I want to do something. Something that we've actually done at Microsoft about four or five years ago is that we actually, when we create our, every employee creates their individual commitments to the business every fiscal year. I'm going to drive this much sales or this much marketing or build this kind of product and What's important here is that every single employee at Microsoft is now declaring in their commitments to their managers, that goes all the way up to the, the CEO itself, um, what, what are you doing to drive a more diverse and inclusive culture internally, but also externally? Um, and so what, what we've seen in the past four or five years since this first came out is that the products that the engineering teams are building are becoming increasingly diverse. The way we market our products are becoming increasingly diverse and inclusive. The way we're talking to customers and selling our messaging is becoming increasingly diverse and inclusive. And so I, it's not just about empowering the few, it's about committing the organization uh, and having every employee to do this. So that's kind of the, the structural piece I think is super uh, critically important. Uh, I think what we've seen in Canada about how we're trying to connect the dots between what is the business impact and the employee resource group, Gleam for us here in Canada, um, has been coming through in a couple of interesting ways. Um, my partner, my not my life partner, my work partner, Ash, who also started Gleam with me, um, we actually worked on the business together where I was more more the go-to-market facing. He was more the product marketing side two or three years ago. Uh, we put our hands up saying, we want to host the next global LGBTQ plus employee uh, summit in Toronto. Previously, it was in Dublin and in Seattle, of course, but we want to bring it home to Canada. Um, and so we, we hosted this event, had about 80 or 90 employees from around Canada, or sorry, around the world, come to Toronto in April. It was icy and embarrassing for us. I, we were hoping for better, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, but we wanted to do a couple things in this. We wanted to, number one, connect the, the values of our organization to the communities in Canada. And so what was super critical for us is as we thought about the venue we sourced, where we put the people in different hotels, where we went out for meals, where we got catering from, we try to actually influence uh, by bringing in queer organizations to the fold. So all the uh, we host the event at the 519. 
fantastic venue for us here in Toronto. We uh, ho got all the hotel rooms from an LGBTQ plus inclusive uh, hotel. Uh, we had all our meals catered by LGBTQ plus catering organizations. So we really try to influence our supply chain to make the reflection of the work speak true. But additionally, that was our gay job. Our day job was to try and drive understanding of Microsoft 365 products, including Teams and SharePoint, all the tools some of us use every single day, but in particular, talking to business decision makers at big companies like Rogers and Air Miles and Coca-Cola and all the banks and telcos, all of them. We want the business leaders to understand about these product visions and truths. And so Ash and I, we threw some events. You know, we did one for real estate and facilities decision makers. We had about 20 people show up. We did one for HR professionals. We had about 30 or 40 people show up. We did one for finance professionals, had about 20 people. So like, it, it was good. You know, these are very senior individuals, but what we, was important for us is to actually connect this internal event we threw uh, for Microsoft employees around the world, the summit at the 519, but we want to tack on a customer event. And we want to figure out how can we engage with LGBTQ plus employees from the ERGs across Canada to come learn with us. And so we had a panel with some folks from Scotiabank and Deloitte. Um, and what net of it was, we had about 250 people show up from representing all the customers we want to talk to, uh, from diverse different levels within the organization, all committed to trying to figure out how to drive more inclusive workplaces. And we're trying to land a message of how Microsoft solutions can help you achieve that by, you know, take the work out of working together. So those leads went through our marketing engines. We actually got some success and traction, actually landing some sales from this. So uh, I think for me, the big story and nugget here is that there is business value. I think it's important mm -hmm. to your core responsibility as your organization? What does your organization services or products provide? And how can you ensure that um, the work of your ERG is helping accelerate that mission? Because often the customers you're talking to probably do represent the LGBTQ plus communities at large. So um, the, the best thing you can do is just trying to connect the values of your organizational internally, uh, but also the uh, external um, and how you want to connect with your customers. Awesome. No, thank you so much for that. And I really I appreciate a couple of these things you shared versus, you know, ensuring that accountability and accountability across the organization. So that emotional labor isn't solely on the employee resource group to bring this to life. Um, I also like the idea of hosting an event for decision makers um, and really bringing them in because that's all sometimes they need. They need the space to start to have those conversations. So I think that's really, really cool. Um, the next question um, I want to direct to Mark. Um, Mark, I also would love to hear kind of any kind of opportunities or ideas that you've seen really successful at your organization. But something Galen had said earlier about, you know, how do you start to recognize the fact that, you know, people have their day job and their gay job? Um, how do we start to ensure that people are recognized for this work, um, that it is off the side of their desk? And how do we make sure that people who want to join an employee resource group see this work as valuable and not just additional labor? Yeah, definitely. Um, so there's a couple of couple of things that I think I'd say against against that topic. The first one is um, making sure that we when we engage with a group of people, a group of like minded people that want to kind of create some change is making sure that they realize that um, taking something like that on as as an over and above their kind of day job is an opportunity for them to actually grow like as a as an individual and as a professional as well um, and i think very often within within large organizations people can be kind of pigeonholed in a specific kind of part or function and this is a way to actually break free from that and get exposure to all sorts of different kind of um, layers within the business um, so that would be the first one is just that realization that yeah, I'm taking something extra on that's like over and above, but there's a real reward behind doing that as well. And there's a real kind of growth that can come from that. Um, and then I think the second point that I would, um, oh, do you know what? My second point has disappeared. I can't think of no. it. <laughs> no, I love that. It's, it's, it's so interesting. Like when I started my employee resource group, um, alongside my uh, co-founder, Matt, um, we focused so much on the impact we wanted to see, not so much about people who are coming together and what they could potentially stand to gain 
from being a part of this. And I, I've never thought of it that way because I mean, the people who are there, they kind of know and are already committed. Like they're here, mm -hmm. they're ready. And, you know, I, I think something you had said to me earlier about, you know, training and development and, and it being a part of how they were um, evaluated. Like, is this yeah. a, a part of um, people's KPOs over at, at Coca-Cola? Is that something that um, you see people do, like adding their employee resource group to their KPOs? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's definitely seen as a method of, of developing colleagues like across the organization. Um, so yeah, it's, it's absolutely kind of ingrained, I think, as a, as a way to kind of stretch an individual into, into like new skills and experiences. Um, and I remembered my second point as well, <laughs> which was just around, um, just with regards to like how you structure like um, a business resource group and something like a big learning at Coca-Cola that, that we kind of took on was originally we had very kind of like formal positions within the group so someone was looking after all of the like budgeting someone was looking after all of the external communications and what we found was it that model didn't allow for enough flexibility within the business resource group and it didn't allow for people who might have peaks and troughs of like work within their day job um, so what we actually moved to was a networked model where we actually identified the biggest tasks that we wanted to accomplish as a group. And then we would identify a leader to go against that task. And then the rest of the group would essentially um, support that person um, in their kind of leadership project. Mm -hmm. And that allowed the team to be able to flex their levels of support. And it also um, enabled us to become really laser focused on the priority work that we wanted to achieve as a group as well. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that'll really help with people not getting burnt out by this work and being able Absolutely. to like feel like, here's where I want to focus. And then I think to Galen's earlier point, it's like we're jamming on the things that are, you know, part of our skill set and the business or the part of the business that we contribute to already. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Thank you so much. Um, awesome. So, Andrew, I will turn it over to you next. Um, I think, you know, when we chatted last time, you I've been working with the CGLC for so long and you talked a little bit about, um, you know, what does it mean to for big corporations to start to connect with LGBTQ businesses and what that impact has been and some of the impact that you've started to carve out at Rogers. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the successes that you've seen or the successes you hope to see um, as you start to continue this work. Absolutely, thanks. And it's funny, I mean, the CGLCC, uh, I, I know them, I know this group from outside of work I do in a, in a charity. And so we made the connection internally and uh, it all started with the fuse being lit when our supplier diversity champion in procurement was connected with the CLGC and started the conversation. And that was a really powerful time because at the time we had the ERG that was doing a bunch of networking, mentoring, a whole bunch of that type of thing. And then we had this procurement prime who was you know, leading that portfolio and really driving towards working through supplier diversity certification. And on our journey, of course, at the beginning, it was a bit of a slower start. We were trying to figure out where we play, what we do. Um, but we did see some like ERG supported activity that drove some support from small business as well as some organization wide stuff. Um, um, a really, really cool success story for us. Um, actually, uh, what three years ago, uh, the ERG team Spectrum at Rogers, um, they actually established what's called the Rogers Boutique. And the Rogers Boutique oh. is actually a way for us to connect our big corporation with a small business. So by leveraging the supply chain and the, uh, the, the, the inventory management of a large office supply company who shall be unnamed um we actually opened up our own our own uh, boutique and that, that boutique was branded um branded cups branded flags pins t-shirts things that employees could buy to do to wear when they're going out volunteering um things that people could wear internally of, of course during pride month like our pride pins um and doing a bunch of that stuff and the cool thing is like we we connected that work with small businesses and independents by you know identifying maybe uh, for example there was an Ojibwe artist who's a close with the CLGC um, did a bunch of work and we have some of that in the Rogers boutique so we actually started to connect that work with the Rogers boutique and supporting some of the small businesses through that kind of that that that, that boutique that we created through that you know 
larger piece. So now the Rogers Boutique is something that the employees of Rogers leverage and they know that, you know, although it's Rogers branded stuff, they're actually supporting some small businesses who created and, 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 and distributed that. Um, one of the most recent successes, I think, is, is one that we're just embarking on now was actually another one sparked by the ERG. We as the ERG kind of flagged to say, you know, hey, our we, we have today's shopping choice and the TFC has, you know, a digital platform, they have the on television platform and they sell a bunch of supplies. So what a cool opportunity for us to connect the dots between, you know, our today's shopping choice folks with the network from the CGLCC. So it's something we did just a few months ago. It was uh, an informal communication. Our pride share Felipe Caputo, who manages a million files said, hey, I think there's something here. And what we did is we actually connected today's shopping choice with the CGLCC Small Business Network. And for the month of June, today's shopping choice is featuring some small businesses as part of our pride shop on today's shopping choice. So that was another really cool one that was born out of an idea from the ERG and that like, or the BRG um, driving a bit of change. I mean, organizational wide, the really cool thing is our procurement partner, Rob in Rogers has also really leaned into the supplier diversity file across the company. We've also done some really cool stuff like um, just recently, we did the Holiday Harmony Project, which was a virtual project to help support some of the small, small businesses uh, suffering over COVID um, and lack of availability to sell in retail locations. And that was really just finding businesses from across Canada that were led, owned by equity seeking or BIPOC community groups and actually giving them the opportunity to leverage some of our media assets and our media personalities to showcase. So the example of being able to connect a small business from Northern Ontario with you know, the power of a, a daytime personality on breakfast television, that was another thing we did. And that was actually driven by the procurement team. And, and so we really created this, this, this cool machine. And now it's just you know, this idea like the, Philippe, uh, the, the idea Felipe came up with, with connecting today's shopping choice, now everybody's kind of excited. Like, how can we do more of that, right? It's like the excitement we had around the corporate or community uh, support pillar a few years ago in terms of connecting with charities. Now it's like, oh, cool. How do we do more cool stuff with small businesses and LGBT owned organizations? So that really started something for us. And I, I, I think it's actually just the start of the journey. And I think there's a lot of learnings and a huge amount of opportunity there for a large organization like Rogers, for example, to be able to do that, right? To, to use our assets, to use our personalities, to give a platform and voice. So it, it, the journey's starting, but I think there's some exciting stuff ahead for sure. Yeah, I mean, I really like the idea that, you know, that small <clears throat> level of intentionality that employee resource groups bring, they bring such a level of intentionality to their work because of their lived experience um, and how that kind of just starts to snowball into you know, effort. And now you're, I'm sure you're getting all the inbound requests of like, hey, we'd love to collaborate. Hey, we'd like to be a part of it um, because you see the success. And I've, I've felt similarly when we've done same thing. I haven't, we haven't got quite to businesses. We've always leaned on our charitable partners and bring in our charities to help us do work and help us um, support us in intentional ways as we support them back. And we've seen the success because we get the asks back and back and back. Uh, exactly. That's really awesome. Okay, so um, why don't we leave you on the screen for now? Just I want to make sure we're getting through our final question. What are um, you have amazing experience in launching an ERG, and all three of you do. Um, and I've had such an amazing opportunity to do this as well in my organization. I'm wondering for those who are looking to start an employee resource group, be a part of one, maybe if we haven't already convinced you to join yours right away, um, we can do that right now. Um, what is some of your advice for everyone listening on setting up an ERG or BERG in their workplace? You know, I, I know my federal panelists are going to have some great recommendations as well, but I have two. I think the first one is take the initiative, right? I mean, when I look at the example for us, a small group of grassroots employees that got together and said, we want to do a bunch of stuff and maybe help the company drive some DNI goals. And oh my gosh, did we over deliver? So take the initiative and start it. Find your allies, find the advocates, you know, build that cross-functional group and start the conversation to understand what you want to achieve, where are the opportunities in your company, and then just start to have the conversations. That's exactly how we started. And it, it, it's, 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 it's really incredible the journey we've had. I think the second piece 
And, you know, I'll put the offer on the table now and I'm sure the, my fellow panels will do the same. It's also like talk to other ERGs. At, yeah. the, at the start of our ERG, we did actually tap on the shoulder of our friend at TD. Uh, we had a connection through TD Bank. TD has a long history of ERGs and ERG successes within the business to help drive business goals, to help drive inclusiveness. Uh, we brought in their VP of diversity and inclusion and we just had a conversation. We talked about where we were, we learned about some of his experiences and some of the roadblocks he's faced. And that was probably the second most important thing that happened to us. One was forming and the second one was getting a bit of that direction to see like where to go, right? How to fish in the right field. Because if you just start with a plan, you'll want to do everything. The risk is you might funnel out because it's probably going to be your gay job versus your day job. But, you know, being able to hone in on some of the things that were quick wins, that was a huge value. So those are my two. I, I would definitely suggest following up on and we're more than open to share with other ERGs actually that's part of what we want to do is connect with other ERGs to figure out how to support each other right so conversations like this yeah I love that and for everyone listening all of our bios are on the CGLC website so feel free to reach out to us I feel like everyone is really open to having these conversations and if you can't already tell we love talking about it um let's turn it over to Galen Galen what about you advice for folks listening starting being a part of their ERG um, how, what advice do you have? Yeah. I mean, working at Microsoft, I had a really smooth experience because there's a, there's already a global organization that existed, uh, for Gleam and Microsoft Global. We just kind of brought that model to Canada. Um, but I'd say the most important thing for others from large organizations where you might have that already executive sponsorship that is, that can make or break an ERG. It's one thing to have a bunch of committed employees saying, we want to make changes. You need someone at the big desk who can advocate for you, who can sponsor you. Um, but also really importantly, how do you manage that executive sponsor? I don't think you should expect that person to come to every single meeting, uh, but I need, you should very intentionally tell that sponsor what you need from them. Uh, make sure that they understand what their expectations are so they can advocate for your organization accordingly. The second piece of advice I'd share is look beyond your own network. Uh, and you know, again, if you're in a larger organization, um, it's easy for myself to get caught up in all the queer people in the marketing organization. I think if I were to give myself advice to myself five years ago, I'd say, go talk to the partner communities, go talk to the sales organizations, talk to the engineering organizations, figure out who those allies are uh, and bring them in. The more you can actually have fingers across the organization, the more likely you are to have really interesting new ideas, engagement strategies, and also lightens the load up from people in marketing or sales, wherever it's being driven from right now. My third piece of advice, um, and it's part of my evolving mindset on ERGs is that, um, if you are at a smaller organization, and hey, if even if you're at a bigger one, um, I don't think you need to have a dedicated LGBTQ plus ERG. Um, all these things that we're talking about intersect with different ERGs themselves. Queer issues are women's issues. Queer issues are also indigenous issues. Queer issues are sustainability issues. So think of it less as taking everyone, putting them in little boxes, and here's our rainbow of diverse groups who are helping to advocate. How can you create one big tent uh, for everyone to work together within the same organization? So I think it's, it's important to have places for people to commune uh, in a safe space to talk about issues that matter to them. But equally important is to create that big tent to figure out where does this all overlap and how can we do more together? Awesome. Galen, hot take. Um, I love it. Um, thank you. And I really like that idea. Um, that's something that we've tried to do in December. We're actually hosting our first ERG summit. I, I like the word summit. We seem to be using it a lot. Um, bringing everyone together to actually do some of that cross-functional work. Um, and something you said, Galen, was around um, bringing outside organizations in. Um, our team had brought in Pride at Work and had them act as first we joined them as a member and then we asked them to help us and just help us craft that idea mark i come back on the screen mark you are on the board of pride at work yeah um and i'm sure that has really helped and contributed to your work but what advice do you have yeah you stole one of my points there oh no <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i had two points um one of them was that kind of external focused seek out the expertise that's that's out there like and pride at work canada i think is a is a really good example of that so yeah i'm, I'm biased because i'm i'm the national yeah. marketing lead on the board um but honestly like working 
closely within that organization has been an incredible experience for me. And I, I can only say um, really, really positive things about their programming. And a lot of it is free. Um, and a lot of it you can just access um, going through their website. And they have a lot of guidance um, around setting up a successful business resource group. So I definitely point you in that direction. And then if you do become a member, which is great to hear that, that your organization is Steph, um, using them as consultants. So we did some big pieces of activity as a business resource group, such as implementing a gender neutral washroom in our head offices and um, implementing the use of pronouns across our organization. And Pride at Work Canada were, were absolutely invaluable when it came to providing the right language, um, the way to approach this, um, you know, within the organization, it was, it was really, really useful for us. Um, and then the second piece of advice that I would have is more kind of on the internal focus. And that is, if you want to set up a business resource group within your organization, think about what the business case would be for that. So I kind of, when I, when I went about engaging with leadership within my organization, I had um, a, a deck, like a slide deck, and I essentially called it my head and heart presentation oh, because it was, it was what makes sense from a business perspective. What are the proven results that um, a diverse organization can achieve? But then also from a kind of obviously from your heart, like what are the kind of emotional reasons to, to have a business resource group like this in place mm -hmm. and I found that two-pronged approach was incredibly successful um, because as long as you kind of displayed those kind of solid kind of business that solid business thinking it really added power to the to the emotional side of what we're trying to do. I love that I really think that's such a great idea and I mean I, I find it so important to do the business case work and it's challenging and I to the earlier points made, like having that cross-functional team to put together that head and heart presentation because they all have line of sight from across the business. I think that's super impactful. And like, how can leadership say no um, to a presentation like that? We did the, the Pride at Work Index and it really helped us focus in on our strategic priorities as well. And it was so, so helpful. Um, can you stay on the screen? Uh, we do have a question. I want to just encourage folks, um, we are rounding out on the end of the presentation, so if you have more questions, please put them in the chat uh, in the Q&A uh, function on Zoom so we can ask and, and hear from our panelists. Um, Mark, a question had come into the audience, uh, from the audience about how can, you, can the ERGs best engage folks in their initiatives, both internally and externally? How can they start to garner some support? Um, do you have any perspective on that? Yeah, I definitely say um, communication is, is absolutely essential when it comes to gathering that support. So I think I would identify the, the existing communication channels that are in your organization and then think about the, the content that you want to put into those communication channels. And for me, I was always very mindful of the, the communication channels within Coca-Cola, are you're speaking to everybody. It's a very, very broad audience. And therefore you really wanna be mindful of how accessible you make the content. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. it needs to be succinct. It needs to be approachable language. It needs to be super accessible so that everyone can feel engaged with it. Um, and you're not kind of going from Kind of zero to a hundred, you're you're taking people on the journey with you. I think is is absolutely essential. Awesome. We did have another audience question, and then I'm going to open it up to Galen and Andrew in a second. Um, but maybe let's just focus in on business case. What are some of the business cases you made for setting up uh, your ERG? What were some of the major takeaways of your presentation? Um, so I guess. I potentially had a bit of a head start being um, in Coca-Cola because we do have brands that specifically target themselves against the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so there was a clear link there around if we're going to authentically engage with these consumers, we need to be walking the walk within our organization. Mm -hmm. so, so there was a real link to be made there around our business objectives on specific brands, um, such as Peace Tea and Diet Coke 
where we we're actively trying to engage um, with those consumers um, and how how can we demonstrate our authenticity in this space rather than just kind of the, the whole kind of pride washing, you know, kind yeah. of being part of a parade. It's like, what are the actual grassroots actions that we're going to take to, to help um, the community? I really uh, so love that, it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And it, that really is that authentic engagement. It's show us what you're doing internally. Andrew, do you want to come up on the screen um, and just share a little bit about, so we had two questions. One was, how do we start to drive engagement for the work that the ERG is doing? And on another question around the business case, what were some of the business case um, ideas that you put forward when bringing your ERG to life? Um, any yeah, question, for, either or. You know what, from the business case perspective, it's interesting. Like I think similar to Mark and the team at Coca-Cola, like we had a brand um, like Fido who really resonated well and actually took on the pride sponsorship nationally for us. So as much as our, Nash, our, our master brand Rogers did, you know, of course, adopt the Rainbow Mobius and did, of course, do the lobby launches for pride and all that good stuff. Fido had an, uh, Fido had an authentic voice. And so for us, the business case actually kind of wrote itself. I mean, our GM and head of Fido um, basically was one of the first people that tapped us and said, look, like this work, we need to work together. We need to make this happen because she had a vision to bring in, you know, artists, to bring in musicians, to bring in social influencers and start to tie it together because it's already conversations that were happening within the brand. So for us, it actually unfolded quite naturally. I mean, at, at the onset of it, we did get budget we did get some dollars to do some networking some mentoring and all that great stuff and you can absolutely quantify the value of of the mentoring networking recruiting in terms of your self-identification which is great um, but that example of having a brand that resonates well and does so authentically i think that for us kind of wrote its own ticket and after the success of our first year uh with fido and pride it just kind of picked up like every year the themes the new ideas um you know the marketing and brand folks that create these incredible campaigns that you know are, are meant to go on social and not necessarily digestible for everybody but meant to target specific audiences they've taken a life of their own and honestly some of the campaigns we as a team sit and watch them and you know you end up in tears and it's so incredible but then you realize it's actually connecting the brand authentically with the consumer and it does so in a really, really great way. So for us, that business case activity was it kind of flowed quite naturally. And as a company, you know, it, it helps as well if you have a broader uh, diversity and inclusion strategy or plan, like we did check that off. Um, mm -hmm. There is a business case for diversity and inclusion around bringing your whole self to work. Uh, but within the LGBT community, it was how do we do it for pride? But then how do you do it outside of pride? How do you do it 365 days of the year? And, you know, that's where our connection with the brand that resonated the most really, really drove some momentum. So massive benefit on that side for us, for sure. Yeah, I think that's such an amazing starting point. So I would definitely kind of echo that and recommend, like, take your organization's mission statement and understand how this work is driving that mission forward, um, because it does flow quite naturally from there. And then you'll also understand the type of impact you can have at your organization. Um, it connects quite beautifully, and then it becomes a part of everybody's language. And I think to the earlier points made, then you'll start to see more people snowball and want to be a part of it. Um, thank Absolutely. you so much, Andrew. Um, Galen, do you have any um, tips and tricks around business case and or engagement? You pulled your hair back. <laughs> I'm getting a little hot in here, so I hold it back. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really liked what Andrew was saying there, in particular when you echoed Steph, which is, you know, looking at your organization's mission statement and figuring out what does that really mean for this community? Um, and so for Microsoft, our mission statement is to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. And when I reflect on that, I think we have an incredible responsibility, but also an opportunity um, to impact millions, if not billions of people around the world uh, to create more inclusive environments. Um, so I think a lot of organizations look to Microsoft as not just a leader, uh, but also as a platform. How can Microsoft technology help create a platform for diverse and inclusive engagements within organizations around the planet, whether it be on Windows or Teams or Skype or Xbox or Bing? So I think uh, for us, the business case is, this is what our customers need. This is what our customers demand. This is what our employees look like. The more we can make our products 
uh, appeal and are functional and are accessible to every single person around the planet, regardless of their gender identity, gender expression, different ability, race, sex, like it, the better for the planet. Um, so I think that's where we hold true. I think there's definitely a business case that you know any organization can do about dollars and cents, and I think that's definitely valuable. But I think for right at the the heart of it. Um, I think Mark said it well about you know, what my head and my heart want. Uh, I think the heart is where this is where it's all at. So um, if your organization cares and the CEO is talking about these things and your your logo has a rainbow on it, uh, to echo Andrew, it's not enough just to say you're uh, supporting your LGBTQ plus employees in June. Um, they're still going to be gay or queer or lesbian or transgendered in November and December. And guess what? So are your customers and partners as well. So the more you can emphasize and showcase leadership every month of the year and not just June, the better. Awesome. No, thank you so much. Um, and everyone, we're kind of rounding up on our time. Um, and I think that one of the final question was, how do you start to celebrate the successes and communicate it out to your organization? And I think the three panelists have demonstrated, you know, when you do that mission and vision work, when you start to kind of think strategically about how your ERG is driving value for your business, that communication also flows incredibly naturally. And in the spirit of pride, that's when you start to talk about all of the amazing work that is being done by the organization 365 days all year round and all the time. Um, I just wanna thank you all for tuning in. I wanna thank our three panelists, um, Galen, Andrew, Mark. Um, we are so grateful for hearing all your perspectives and all of the amazing successes you've had. Um, to everybody listening, the, the invite stands. Um, all four of us, our bios are on um, CGLC's website. So feel free to reach out to us. I feel like you know this is a network that it can exist outside of your organization and we're always happy to chat. Um, thank you very much for tuning in and have the best day, everybody.